Well, good morning, church. My name is Mike Kresnick, and I'll be leading us through the liturgy this morning. And Jared and the band will be leading us through our music, our worship. So together, let's join our hearts and rise together and worship our triune God. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. O oh, great God and Father, in Christ Jesus, you have surrounded us with your protection and love. We turn away from all lesser goods to worship you today, for you are our true good. In our weariness, may we know your strength. In our suffering, may we sing for joy. In our chaos, may your spirit bring us peace. We pray in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you, one God, forever and ever. Amen. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, Alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam.
God to move toward us and to move in us because without the Lord we are weak in this battle against sin and our enemy the devil. This is not a physical weakness but a spiritual one that only the Lord can supplant with his strength. So in our confession today we confess our sin and we ask the Lord to give us strength in this battle against sin and against our enemy. So let us pray this together. Almighty God, have mercy on us, for we are weak. We have sinned against you and against one another and have given ground to the enemy of our souls. Forgive us, uphold us, and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual battle, but may firmly resist sin and our enemies until we finally win the complete victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear now God's words of pardon and peace from his people. From 1 John chapter 2. My little children, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. To all who hope in Jesus Christ this morning, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. This is the good news of the gospel. Rest in it and be at peace. Safe into the haven, God. We 
some of the words that we just sang in that song. Other refuge have I none, I helpless hang on thee. Leave, oh leave me not alone, support and comfort me. What is this support and comfort that we sing of? When we are experiencing the joys of life or the darkness of death and sorrow, where does our comfort come from? Using the words on the screen, let's answer this question together from the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Now let's turn to those near to us and greet them in the name of Christ Jesus.
Well, friends, again, my name is Mike, and I am glad that you are here uh, with us this morning. And I want to remind you what it is that we are doing here. Christian worship is countercultural. Every week when we gather here, we are resisting the narratives our culture urges us to live by. And one of those narratives is relativism. The world around, around us wants us to believe that there are no absolutes, that nothing is fixed, permanent, and given. That viewpoint is actually self-defeating. To say everything is relative is to make a statement of absolute truth. Christian worship pulls us into a world of groundedness, where we can find our footing, where we can find a solid place to stand rooted in the reality of God and Scripture and of tradition. So here at Coram Deo, we are not afraid of relativism. We're not afraid of skepticism. We're not afraid of uncertainty. We rejoice in the opportunity to wrestle together with these important questions. And that kind of wrestling takes place within community, not in isolation. So let me take a few minutes to tell you how you can get connected here at Coram Deo. First, you can sign up for our weekly email. It goes out every Monday. And you can sign up right on the front page of our website at cdomaha.com. Second, you can text the words connect me to the number you see there on the screen. And Ryan Meyer, our director of connections, will follow up with you. Uh, Thirdly, you can stop by the connection desk in the atrium, and uh, that place you can, at that place, you can go connect with some leaders and uh, get information about what is going on within our church. Uh, You'll also find a bookshelf out there uh, where we stock a few books that are especially helpful for questions about Christianity, theology, and and the Bible. Um, You may have seen, we have a, a book table out there that says free on it. You can take those books. Please don't leave here without taking a book or picking up a book and giving it to somebody who may need it. Um, Here at Coram Deo, uh, we don't take an offering during our worship services. Instead, you'll find an offering box near the doors on your way outside of the building. And we trust that if you're a Christian, you're giving generously to the Lord. Now, at this part of our service, we um, are invited to pray together. So won't you join me? Most high God, you are our refuge and our strength, and you are the only God worthy of trust and worship. The scriptures promise us that when we make you our shelter in this life, that we will abide in the protection of the almighty God. May we find and experience your love and your joy and your peace in your protection, Lord God. As we, imbi- uh, uh, as we abide in you, Almighty God, may we find deliverance from the wickedness of our sins. From day to day, we battle the ways of the flesh, old sin patterns, pride and defensiveness, coping mechanisms, addiction to substances, addiction to pleasure, even addiction to approval. Defend us, save us, and deliver us, O Lord. As we abide in you, Almighty God, may we find deliverance from the deceit and darkness of the world. The world twists and distorts what is good and beautiful and true. Where we have loved the ways of the world, may we turn from the world and may our loves be ordered to your spirit and to your word. Defend us, save us, and deliver us, O Lord. As we abide in your love, deliver us from the works and assaults of the devil. And where we have succumbed to his oppressions and temptations, grant us your mercy and grace to repent and walk in the ways of Christ Jesus and to enjoy the gracious companionship of our church family. Defend us and save us and deliver us, O Lord. And now as we turn our attention to hearing the scriptures read and preached, we pray in one voice as a church. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Ephesians chapter 6, 
verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. The word of God for the people of God. Well, hey, it's good to see all of you this morning. Um, we are going to consider this text as we continue in this sermon series we've been preaching throughout the month of January. Uh, for the past 12 months, as you know, the entire world has been at war against an invisible enemy, a virus that first crossed into the human population near Wuhan, China. An awareness of this microscopic organism has totally changed the way we live. And it's created, for most of us, a sense of weariness. It's tiring to be on the alert all the time, right? Never before have you been so aware of the physical distance between you and another person. Never before have you been so concerned about whether everyone around you is wearing their mask correctly. Never before have you thought about wearing two masks, which apparently is a thing now. I don't know all the reasons why God in his providence has allowed us to experience what we've experienced this past 12 months, but the whole thing we've been walking through and living through is actually a powerful reminder of what's true every day of our lives in the spiritual realm. Though we can't see it, though we're not always aware of it, we are always under siege by an invisible enemy. Every day of our lives, an intense spiritual conflict rages around us. Now, it's possible to ignore it. It's possible to be naive to it. Uh, it's even possible, as with coronavirus, to believe the whole thing is a hoax. However, the scriptures are very matter-of-fact about the spiritual nature of evil. And as we'll see this morning, the Bible's view of evil is the only one that can actually make sense of the depth and the pervasiveness of evil as we actually experience it in the world. So, before we go further, uh, we need to address some of the modern skepticism that I think keeps us from taking the Bible seriously on these matters. And so let's talk about skepticism toward the devil and skepticism toward war metaphor real briefly. Uh, the devil has fallen on hard times recently. After centuries of being taken seriously in literature and in art and in music, the devil has now been relegated to the dustbin of history, right? We've moved beyond all of that superstitious, supernatural, mythical stuff. To quote Nacho Libre, we believe in science, <laughs> right? Well, before you go too far down that road, I, I want you to take a minute to consider the scope and the strength of evil as it actually exists in the world. How exactly do you explain six million Jews exterminated in the Holocaust? Or how do you explain two million women trafficked worldwide in the commercial sex trade? Or how do you explain over one million Uyghurs right now being systematically exterminated by the Chinese government? When we think of these things, the word demonic doesn't seem entirely out of place, does it? Sometimes we want to try to find one tragic figure, a Hitler or a Stalin, to explain the nature of radical evil in the world. But it's just not quite that simple, is it? Keeping one million Uyghurs detained in labor camps, for instance, takes tens of thousands of guards and officials. 
ordinary people who are complicit in the evil and injustice. It's almost as though there's a power that comes over people. It's almost as though there's a darkness that holds people in its grip. Listen to this observation from Old Testament scholar Ian Duguid. If you believe that the universe you see around you is all there is, then you have no rational basis on which to be shocked and outraged at evil. What we call evil must be an emotional response within us triggered by evolutionary biology. But the Bible has a richer and deeper explanation for the sad world we find ourselves in. An explanation that allows us to recognize the profound reality of evil and the invisible spiritual forces that lie behind its constant reappearance in different shapes and forms. Despite all our human progress, evil never goes away, does it? It just reappears in new and different forms. And when you start to ponder the pervasiveness and the permanence of evil, the Bible's point of view is the only one that's really persuasive. Let me deal with a second expression of skepticism many of us have, and that is skepticism about war metaphor. We live in a culture where battle language has driven our political discourse for decades, right? Each side wants us to believe that we're in a war for the future of America, and that the other side is the enemy, and that the only way forward is for them to be defeated. You see this rhetoric on both the right and on the left, and it's infected every part of our public discourse. And so when we come to the scriptures and we hear the language of battle, put on the whole armor of God, I think something in us grows tense, or at least skeptical. Is this going to be a sermon about how we're right and they're wrong? Is this going to be a call to fight against our cultural enemies? Well, let me be straightforward. There is a fight. We are, in fact, in a war. The problem is not with war metaphor. The problem is with where we draw the battle lines. We tend to draw the line between us and our enemies, whoever they are. So we are on the side of good, and they are on the side of evil, whoever they may be. The Bible, however, draws the line straight through the center of every human person. In you, a battle rages between good and evil. You have the capacity for acts of great moral goodness and for acts of great moral depravity. The problem isn't with war language. The problem is with where we think the war is. If we would spend half as much time fighting the evil within us as we do fighting the perceived evil over there, we'd help to diffuse much of the skepticism and cynicism that pervades our culture. So, Those are a few words by way of introduction. Uh, Let's now get back to the main thrust of the sermon. We're looking this month at God's good news for the weary. And I want to propose to you that part of the reason you're weary is because you're in a battle. Every day, you are assaulted by dark spiritual powers who are bent on the destruction of your hope your joy, and your faith in Christ. And because we live in such a disenchanted age, because we are so rationalistic and so materialistic, you're unlikely even to be aware of the battle. Friend, you're not merely fighting against your own cynicism or despair or discouragement or sin or suffering. Those things themselves are the flashpoints for a greater battle taking place underneath and around and beyond them. And this morning, God has good news for you in the struggle. So in the weariness of spiritual opposition, I want you to know you need three things. You need to know the enemy, you need to know the Savior, and you need to know your role. You need to know the enemy, you need to know the Savior, you need to know your role. 
The title of this series is Good News for the Weary. And I want you to remember that all of Scripture is God's good news for us. Uh, It's not as though we have to comb through this passage like detectives looking for the good news. The whole passage is good news. Scripture is good news. This particular passage in Ephesians 6 is good news for us because in it, God is giving us a realistic view of evil. So let me contrast a realistic view of evil, which is what this passage is giving us, with a sentimental view of evil, which is what most of us come preloaded with. We are prone toward, and our culture is prone toward, a sentimental view of evil. And there is both a left-leaning and a right-leaning version of this. Here's the left-leaning view of sentimental evil. It sounds like this. Evil is no match for the human spirit. If we just all band together and use the same social media hashtag, we can solve all the world's problems. We just need a little more unity, a little more belief in ourselves. That's a sentimental and foolish view of evil. But there's also a right-leaning version of that. It sounds like this. The devil made me do it. If there's evil, it's always the devil's fault. When in doubt, cast the devil out. Just a few weeks ago, Father John Zulsdorf, a Catholic priest from Wisconsin, held an exorcism to drive out the demons of election fraud. That's a sentimental view of evil. The Bible calls us, friends, to reject sentimentality and to embrace realism. I want you to notice the layered, nuanced, realistic picture of evil this text gives us. First of all, it shows us that the enemy we face is powerful. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Notice those words, rulers, authorities, powers, forces. The text is stacking up these power terms to give us a sense of the complexity and the power of evil. Right? Since the language here is language of struggle, language of battle, language of a fight, imagine the introduction of a boxing match or of a UFC fight. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Tonight's match, in the red corner, fighting out of the depths of Hades, the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and spiritual forces of evil. And in the blue corner, fighting out of Cormdale Church Community in Omaha, Nebraska, Jennifer. It's not really a fair fight, is it? That's the point of the text. You, as a flesh and blood, mortal, frail human being, are no match for the spiritual forces of evil. And don't you feel that reality in your own soul? Isn't there some area of your life where you feel totally powerless. Perhaps it's in your struggle against sexual sin. Perhaps it's in your battle with anger or your fight against anxiety or your efforts to control your tongue. The point of this text, friends, is that evil is powerful. Notice also The enemy is strategic. Look at verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That word schemes is a word that has connotations of cunning, crafty, wily. The enemy is strategic. Listen to what Richard Baxter, writing almost 400 years ago, said to pastors in his day. 
Take heed to yourselves, because the tempter will make his first and sharpest attack on you. You are sure to have his most subtle insinuations, his most incessant solicitations, and his most violent assaults. Take heed to yourselves, lest he outwit you. The devil is a greater scholar than you are, and a more nimble disputant. He will make you the instrument of your own ruin. And that's really the strategy, to make you the instrument of your own ruin. Let's talk about what the enemy's strategy looks like on a normal day, when a normal Christian is trying to practice a normal spiritual discipline. Ian Duguid says it this way, when you try to set aside a few minutes to read the Bible, you will find that time to be the special object of the devil's attention. All your appointments for the day and the items on your to-do list are immediately presented for your attention. The internet suddenly feels overwhelmingly attractive. You feel an urgent need to check your email or even to go to the gym. Does this resonate with any of you? Do any of you experience this? This is a classic strategy of the enemy, and now you can see it for what it is. When you sit down and try to spend a few minutes reading or hearing or meditating on Scripture, suddenly there are a million other things you feel interested in doing. Now you know what's going on underneath that particular struggle. Listen, likewise, to the observation of John Owen, again, an older uh, saint writing centuries ago. He says this, we need to be intimately acquainted with the ways, wiles, methods, advantages, and occasions which give lust its success. Notice he uses those synonyms, wiles, methods, advantages. These are all synonyms for the word schemes right here in Ephesians 6.11. He goes on to say, this is how men deal with their enemies. They search out their plans, ponder their goals, and consider how and by what means they have prevailed over them in the past. Those who succeed in mortifying lust deal with it in this way. Even when lust is not enticing and seducing, they consider while at leisure, this is still our enemy. This is his way and his methods. These are his advantages. This is the way he has prevailed. We must learn to say, this is your usual method. I know what you are up to. So to be always ready is the beginning of our warfare. That is wise and insightful counsel. So part of God's good news to us in the weariness of spiritual opposition is to help us know our enemy, to help us see the power and the strategies of evil. It's amazing the success you can have in something when you simply work to know your enemy, isn't it? Again, let's use the current moment as a simple illustration. Think about all the energy that's been poured into understanding COVID-19 over the past 10 months. I mean, you realize the normal process for developing a vaccine for anything is five to seven years, right? And we have not one vaccine, but four so far in 10 months. Do you know why? Because the entire world took this particular viral enemy seriously. We felt the weariness of lockdowns and school closures and crowded emergency rooms, and we decided it was time to get to know this enemy so this enemy could be defeated. Friends, the scriptures are calling us to that same sort of tenacity in the fight against evil and sin. Know your enemy. But not only do you need to know your enemy, you need to know the Savior. On the surface, it looks like this passage is telling you to put on your armor and fight, right? And if that's the call, then for many of us, it's just an invitation to more weariness, isn't it? If our best hope is to muster up some more strength and stand and fight, that just feels tiring. But friends, the key to this passage, 
the key that opens up a whole new world of beauty and grace and power is to slow down and read carefully. Whose armor is it? It's the armor of God. It's the armor that God himself wore when he won the decisive battle against sin and Satan on behalf of his people. What makes this passage come alive with a new richness is when you realize that every piece of armor mentioned here has an Old Testament backstory. This armor didn't come from nowhere. The belt of truth is an image drawn from Isaiah chapter 11, a passage we read every Advent season. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. At Advent, we remember that this passage is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the rod of Jesse, the branch from the root of David's tree. Jesus, our Savior, wore the belt of truth when he came as the great son of David to bring his kingdom of righteousness and peace. Likewise, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation are images drawn from Isaiah chapter 59, where we read, the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. The Lord Jesus, friends, wore the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation when he came to redeem his people and deliver them out of exile, conquering their enemies and bringing them into peace and safety. The shoes of the gospel of peace draw our minds back to Isaiah 52, the passage we heard in our call to worship this morning, where Isaiah says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Who is that person? It's the Lord Jesus. As he stood on the Mount of Olives teaching his disciples, Jesus' feet were bringing the good news of the gospel of peace. He was the one who brought liberty to the captives and sight to the blind and who proclaimed to us the year of the Lord's favor. The shield of faith is an image drawn from Genesis chapter 15 where God says to Abram, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And we know that God's promise to Abraham finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ who raised the shield of faith against his enemies by trusting in the Father even as he went willfully to the cross. The sword of the Spirit is a reference to Isaiah chapter 42 where speaking again of the servant of the Lord, it says, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. Jesus wielded the sword of the Spirit during his temptation in the wilderness when he answered every one of Satan's lies by quoting Scripture. And in so doing, he defeated the devil's lies, and he shares that victory with us. The armor of God, friends, is the armor of God. It's the armor worn by Jesus the suffering servant, when he came to fight the decisive battle against evil and sin and death and to set us free forever from their tyranny. Before this passage gives you anything to do, it gives you a reason to worship. It gives you good news. The good news for the weary is that the promised deliverer has come and he has fought the battle on behalf of his people. And so in your weariness, You need to know the Savior. When you are weak, he is strong. When you are faithless, he remains faithful. When you fail to take up the armor of God, he intercedes for you and defends you against your enemies. And now, standing in his victory, 
the Savior invites you to put on the same armor that he wore. The fight isn't over yet. In the midst of your weariness, you need to know your enemy. You need to know your Savior. And then finally, you need to know your role. Notice three times in this passage the command that's given to us as God's people reading this word. In verse 10, in verse 13, and verse 14, the exhortation is stand, stand, stand. Your role is to stand and hold the ground that Christ has already won. You are called to engage the fight, but the strength is not yours. The armor is not yours. The resources are not yours. Christ has fought the battle for you, and now by the Holy Spirit, Christ is fighting the battle in you and through you. And so you're called to participate in the fight through dependence and reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Notice the very first verse. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You are to be strong in a strength that isn't yours. It might help to think of your soul or of your being as a territory that's been occupied by an evil dictator. And now the Lord Jesus, the rightful king, has made a surprise attack, has deposed that evil ruler, and has taken back the throne. He reigns. He rules. He is in charge. But not every piece of territory has yet been reclaimed. There are still pockets of land where the enemy's troops linger. They no longer have authority, but they still seek to do harm and to sow chaos and to create fear. And what the new king is doing is slowly, methodically, advancing the battle line until the enemy is pushed out of every corner and every crevice. Friends, when we pray, as we did this morning, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what we're praying for. We're praying, God, let your kingdom keep advancing in my life and in the world until darkness is pushed all the way out. The king will advance his kingdom. The king will take the lead in pushing out the enemy. Your job is to hold the ground he's already won, to stand. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit. So let's go back to where we started. Part of the reason you're weary is because you're in a battle. And often you don't realize it, or you're not aware of it. You're not in tune to it. If you're looking to score a quick military victory, which troops are you going to attack? Not the ones that are ready, but the ones that are unprepared. You're going to look for where is the least prepared part of your enemy's army, and that's where you're going to attack. And that's often what's happening in our lives. Satan is a good strategist. And he's often scoring easy victories because we're unprepared. We're naive to his schemes. And so God's good news to us this morning is, hey, you're in a battle. Your life is part of a cosmic struggle between good and evil. This is about way more than just you. So, open your eyes and see the battle you're in. Know your enemy, know the Savior, and know your role. Friends, I want to remind you, this passage is full of imagery and metaphor. It's likely 
that Paul wrote this section of the letter from prison. And I suspect, perhaps, that as he pens these words, he's looking across his cell at the Roman soldier who is guarding him. He's noticing that soldier's armor. And he's taking that as inspiration for this passage and this imagery. Now, there are ways that people can get a little too cute with this passage, right? Urging you to imagine yourself putting on each piece of the armor. And if that's helpful to you, then great. But you know what the core message of this passage is? You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're at war with a powerful spiritual enemy. So live a life of readiness. That's what the passage is telling you. Don't be sentimental. Don't be naive. Don't be discouraged. Be ready. Be alert. And stand. Getting dressed is something you do every day. Putting on armor is something a Roman soldier did every day. Likewise, what this passage envisions is some kind of daily practice here. Some kind of daily ritual whereby we ground ourselves in the reality of union with Christ by the power of the Spirit. Here's one way that could look for you on a normal Wednesday morning. Perhaps you begin the day with some some expression of prayer and faith like this. Lord Jesus, I belong to you. And I know that today I'm going to face a battle against my own fears and insecurities and sin, against a world that does not recognize your lordship, and ultimately against a spiritual enemy who wants to defeat me and who wants to oppose your kingdom. So, Lord, I want to be ready for the fight. So I acknowledge today that what you say is true, and I'm living by your truth. I acknowledge that I'm united with the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is mine, and that I am his. I acknowledge that I'm a messenger of the gospel in every situation I find myself in today. I acknowledge that whatever I face today, you are my Father, and I can trust you. I thank you that death has already been defeated, so there's really nothing that I have to fear Would you fill me now with your Holy Spirit? Would you ground me in your word? Would you prepare me for whatever I will face today? Now, let's go. And friends, if that's what a Wednesday morning might look like, then you know what Sunday morning is? Sunday morning is when the battle line moves forward. Sunday morning is when the kingdom of God takes new ground as all the Christians in the world, together, remember the gospel and worship Jesus and renew their hope in him. You're not alone. We're in this together. So let's pray, and then let's come to the Lord's table. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the wake-up call and the reminder of the power and complexity of evil. Thank you for reminding us that we face a strategic and powerful enemy who is first of all your enemy and who is our enemy because we belong to you. So we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you took up the armor of God and fought the decisive battle and have utterly defeated this enemy. Help us remember that the cross is the place where you won the victory and that the empty tomb is proof that you have conquered and that we fight a defeated foe. Help us never forget the battle has already been won. And yet, Lord, the battle is not over. Your kingdom is now advancing and you call us into the fight. You call us into the fray. So Holy Spirit, fill us, awaken us, where we are slothful and lazy, rejuvenate us, where we are ignorant, bring clarity, and where we are passive, bring a new kind of initiative and activity. Help us see the enemy, help us see the beauty of your victory, 
and help us take up the armor of God and stand today and every day. We ask this for our good and for your glory. Amen. Well, now, friends, we're invited to the Lord's table. To all sinners who are grieved and humbled by their sin. To all the weak who need their faith to be strengthened. To all who love the triune God and wish to love him more. Jesus Christ now invites you to his table. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said to his disciples, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. In the same way, he took a cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it, all of you, in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and we're reminded that this is the decisive victory that is now offered to us, that we fight evil, not in our own strength, not in our own power, but through the death and resurrection of Christ. And so in coming to the Lord's table, we must come in humility and in honesty. Those present among us who have not yet come to Jesus in faith and in baptism should not partake, but instead use this as a time for prayer and reflection. And if you would profess to be a Christian, but you know that you're living in willful disobedience to God, you also should not partake and instead take this opportunity to come to God in fresh repentance. To those weary saints who have failed this week to stand firm as they ought, Jesus, the victorious King, invites you to come and be renewed by his grace. And so as we sing, as we continue to offer ourselves before the Lord in worship, we're going to invite you, beginning in the front of the room, to, to come out the left side of where you're seated and come forward to one of these four tables there you'll find a server who will place a piece of bread in your hand and then you can take a cup of wine or a cup of juice and make your way back down the right side of your seating area to your seat and then partake there. At the back of the room will be an additional set of servers. They'll have gluten-free bread there if you need that. If you're in the balcony, you can make your way down either to the back or to any of the aisles you prefer. And if you're downstairs, you'll notice a similar flow. There'll be a main table there with bread, wine, and juice and another table that's gluten-free if you need that. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for us. This is Christ's blood shed for us. Come now to the Lord's table as you're ready. Thoughts 
You put together 
Um, if you'd like a, to have a pastor or a leader pray with you, I want to invite you to come and sit in these front rows. We'll be standing up here waiting for you. We'll keep an eye out for you, and we'd, we'd love to pray with you uh, to go to the Lord with you. Now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Go now with the Lord's countenance upon you and receive his peace. Alleluia. Amen.